Now testing the translation into English. In case you don't have your headsets yet, your receivers, please uh, go get them, okay? Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Recife and to the Global Policy Dialogue on the Triple Planetary Crisis and Loss of Biodiversity, Nature, Pollution, and Waste. This is a joint initiative by the CIPOP platform and the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, Global Challenges Foundation, and the Harish Bull Foundation. I am Mara Folico, I'm the founder and coordinator of programs at the Plataforma CIPO, which is a research institute led by women. Many of us are present here and we dedicate to themes of climate, governance and international organizations. So I have the pleasure to moderate this opening panel and it's important to remind you that we're being broadcast live on our YouTube channel, Plataforma CIPO. So welcome as well to our online audience. Well, let me remind you now that we are going to be having time for questions in the end. So if you're listening to us on YouTube, please write down your comments and questions in the chat because our team will be monitoring and we're going to be transmitting this, these questions for whoever you ask. So Adriana Bittenu will have the floor now. She's the Executive Director of Plataforma CIPO. She's going to give you welcoming words and thank you so much for being here. Good morning, everyone. You are all very welcome. I was asked to make some comments in English, which I don't usually do when I'm here in our country, but I'm going to open an exception for you, considering how many participants we have from abroad. as well as uh, London and Mexico City. So we extend a very warm welcome, especially to those of you who came uh, from very far away. I'd like to thank our partners, Stimson, Global Challenges Foundation, FEPS, Heinrich Boll Stiftung, and of course, GGIN, the Global Governance Innovation Network of which CIPO is a very proud member. I would also like to thank our brilliant team who has worked under the leadership of Mayara Foli and our local researcher, Juan Kumaru, to organize this event in great detail. Um, thanks uh, for accepting our invitation. The triple planetary crisis, the nexus between climate change, loss of biodiversity, and pollution and contamination is perhaps the problem of our times. It is an existential challenge that must be addressed not only within individual states, but also by civil society and private sector and through international cooperation, which is why we have brought you here together to brainstorm with us solutions for how global governance can be made more effective, more just and more democratic in tackling this crisis. No doubt, we face challenging times. In addition to the threats to democracy that we have recently experienced here in Brazil and abroad, uh, the ongoing pandemic and the highly unequal responses to the sanitary crisis pose particular problems to the developing world, as do sharpening geopolitical tensions, especially those between the United States and China, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In the multilateral sphere, I would venture to say that the developing world finds itself particularly fragmented. Far too often, the G77, the non-aligned movement, are taking defensive stances rather than putting forth proposals for reform. Uh, even though they represent, we represent, 152 countries out of the 198 UN member states. 
almost 80% of the votes at the UN. Current proposals, including, and here you will notice some disagreement bef between my very good friend Richard and I, our common agenda has been drafted and is led mostly by actors from the global north. It represents a watered down reform agenda. It introduces concepts that have not been subjected to proper negotiation. And it leaves out demands that have been made by global south countries for decades, especially reform of the Security Council. Without addressing the underlying distribution of power that is locked into the UN system in particular, meaning reform is not possible. I therefore invite you to think, yes, through our common agenda, as Richard will invite you, but outside the box. What are other paths possible for global governance reform, whether through the UN system or outside of it? What should be the role of the Bretton Woods institutions, of the World Trade Organization, of ad hoc coalitions such as the BRICS and the G20? It's very important that we think creatively in times of crisis. And here you are in a privileged position to do so, including from Global South perspectives. On the good news, bon dia. <laughs> On the good news, um, we also uh, are now in a country that has a new progressive government. In a moment where other Latin American countries are also looking forward and being more constructive, including with respect to environmental, climate, biodiversity, and sustainable development issues. This cannot be taken for granted. Here in Brazil, we have a lot of homework to do to reverse the perverse damage caused both in Brazil and abroad over the past four years. But uh, we stand committed and we have a new government that openly has committed not only to the defense of multilateralism, but also to addressing the climate emergency and doing so in the defense of democracy. We will produce out of this event, as in, in every uh, past global policy dialogue, a report with ideas and recommendations for policymakers and other relevant stakeholders involved in global governance reform. So again, we invite you to um, share your ideas. We are using Chatham House rules. Um, this uh, allows you to speak freely, but do keep in mind that sometimes Chatham House rules are used to appropriate other ideas. So if you're going to use ideas, I always suggest check in with the source of ideas so that you know this does not happen. Um, Sipo also hopes that this will be, in fact, the first in a series of South policy dialogues. The idea is not to exclude the Global North, but to really provide Global South perspectives on these issues. So I hope that this will not be the last time that we come together in Brazil or in Latin America. And thank you very much for being here. And now I will hand over to my very good friend, uh, Richard Ponzio to also give his welcome remarks. Muito obrigada and have fun.
private sector and international organizations to the preparations of a, a ministerial forum that will take place in September of this year, followed a year later by the 2024 Summit of the Future. Uh, these are both uh, overseen by the UN General Assembly. We have a few ambassadors here uh, involved in the UN's work directly in New York. And along with uh, several tracks of negotiations, six to eight tracks are being developed that will feed into these negotiations. They together provide what we literally can call a once in a generation opportunity. The last time was in 2005, the 60th anniversary of the UN, to look at these environmental governance challenges at the heart of our meeting and broader global governance reforms. And I do agree with my friend, Adriana, that the our common agenda of the Secretary General influencing this uh, intergovernmental process does not go nearly far enough, especially on the triple planetary crisis. The second and third intergovernmental processes are, of course, the COPs. We just had the uh, biodiversity meeting in Montreal, and many of you, I believe, were directly engaged in the Shah Mar Sheikh uh, COP on climate action. And while both have continued to deliver some progress, as we've seen in recent weeks, as we're going to be discussing in our four breakout groups later this morning, these two global environmental uh, governance vehicles require imaginative rethinking and upgrades to keep <coughs> pace with today's costly, complex, and fast-moving global environmental problems. To conclude, though I won't have time to really expand on these upcoming activities, I do want to encourage you to interact with, there's an amazing CEPO team here at the heart of today's meeting. My colleague, Nudara Youssef, if you kindly raise your hand, facilitates the Global Governance Innovation Network, and myself, we'd be happy to tell you about these upcoming activities, several related to the triple planetary crisis. First, a seven-part e-consultation series, including a special focus on environmental governance uh, is just getting underway now with our partner, the Coalition for the UN We Need, feeding into a fully hybrid Global Futures Forum, which is planned for the 20th through the 22nd of March in New York. Then, from the 21st to the 22nd of June in Washington, D.C., at the U.S. Institute of Peace and Georgetown University, is the annual meeting of the Academic Council on the UN System. And this will be preceded, as I noted, by another GPD, focusing on uh, the UN's peace and security architecture. This will be hosted at the Stimson Center. A, this time next year, the GGIN is exploring with the Savannah Center in Abuja, Nigeria, a GPD on the theme of the future of Africa and global governance. And finally, for those of you here in Hasifi who are able to join us on Saturday morning, we'll be holding a retreat and you'll learn about ways you can give substantive contributions to the work of two very important initiatives we're eager to uh, participate in, the Climate Governance Commission, and you'll soon hear from Mary Robinson from the Elders, who is uh, one of the co-leaders of the Climate Governance Commission, and the high-level advisory board of the Secretary General. This is the follow-on study to the Our Common Agenda. So thank you once again, those joining us online and here in beautiful Hasipi. to our colleague from the Global Challenges Foundation, Dr. Ma Magnus Jaiborn. Magnus. to come here, but I, I am very confident that it will be well worth this, the time spent. Uh, Global Challenges Foundation is uh, very proud to be part of this group of partners, but also very proud to be part of organizing or uh, be part of this um, partner in this event. 
Global Challenges Foundation is a Stockholm-based foundation that is focusing on global catastrophic risks and the lack of adequate global governance systems to, to handle those risks together. And the tri triple planetary crisis, of course, is at the heart of those risks that we focus on. Uh, so we try to both work with understanding the risks, but also to take the step to find how do we work better together to, to deal with those risks. So I think that this meeting is very good. Just as we have a triple planetary crisis, a, like a set of planetary crises that are very tightly interlinked, we are also could talk about the triple planetary solution actors. Like we have, we need to understand the crisis that we are facing. Then we need to have proper scientific foundations for our thinking. But we also need to have the decision makers around the table. And I think that the, the, the civil society organizations also play a very, very important role, both in creating new ideas, but also to, to uh, bring in uh, voices from outside the decision making rooms, but also to bring the ideas out to the people and get legitimacy for the reforms that are needed. So I think that we here form a very good group to, to deal with this. We have decision makers both from a national and regional perspective, but also from international uh, arena, from the UN. We have civil society organizations here. We have representatives from the Earth Commission, which is a um, set of a group of scientists that try to understand the planetary crisis that we are facing. So I look very much forward to discussing these issues with you, and I hope that we will come a little step forward uh, today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Annette von Schönfeld. Uh, from the Heinrich Böll Foundation, and good morning to all, all of you. And it's really a huge pleasure to be, uh, to, for me to welcome you also, yeah, as the Heinrich Böll Foundation here in Recife, to spend the next two days debating the triple planetary crisis. Uh, the challenges related to all three crises uh, are urgent and enormous, and even more so in the context of societal polarization. I'm not so fluent in English as my previous speakers are, but I hope it's fine. Uh, and that we are experiencing right now. How can we create an even broader consensus on the necessity to confront these crises? How might we translate this, ne this necessity into politics where there is still an enormous number of doubters and opponents to this crisis, even among decision makers? In Brazil, the last four years have thrown the country far back in this climate, in its climate and environmental politics. There are similar situations in other countries too, so how shall we deal with all these difficult difficulties that are added on top of the incredible challenging issue, issues themselves? How can we deal with all the different velocities involved? The velocity of planetary destruction, the time needed to construct visions of a different interpretation of well-being and development, and the delays while constructing and executing politics of profound changes of adaptation and mitigation in all mentioned areas. I think this last one is for us to discuss how might we be speeding up this maybe a little bit. It is in, of incredible importance that, all, that this high level group of participants is taking their time to be here, to follow up the debates and ideas, and maybe we will come up with some concrete suggestions for politics. It is also important that this meeting is taking place in the Global South, putting on the table with great emphasis south southern visions, necessities, and capacities. As Adriana already mentioned, Brazil is back on the international stage, and there could not have been a better place and moment to realize this event here than he here in Brazil. The Heinrich Böll Foundation is a German institution funded by public resources and close to the German Green Party. The foundation works as think tank, especially on issues related to climate and environment, and as a promoter of political education and dialogue. We are present in 35 countries worldwide with local offices, and we mainly work with civil society. 
One of them is one of the offices, sorry, is here in Brazil. Our aim is to work for a climate neutral world, including strongly the aspects of social and environmental justice. This is why we seemed, it seemed self-evident and natural for us to be part of this meeting. I would like to thank all co-organizers uh, for taking, and especially CIPO and the Global uh, Governance Innovation Forum for taking the initi initiative to realize this meeting here and now even if the new government has barely st started and new climate politics are only just emerging. But maybe that's exactly why the moment is so fine. And I would, of course, like to thank all the other co-organizers as well. And it's a pleasure to be part of this. Uh, I wish it us a fruitful discussion. Obrigada. Obrigada, Adriana, Richard, Magnus e Anete. Pelas. Bom, obrigada, Adriana, Magnus, Anete pel... e Richard, claro, <risos> pelas suas contribuições iniciais. Eu vou passar a palavra agora aos nossos palestrantes desse painel de abertura, que tem como objetivo fornecer um panorama. As its aim to offer an overview of the impacts and also of the possible solutions uh, to tackle the planetary crisis, and uh, particularly in the countries, in the emerging countries. Our first speaker will be Mary Robinson. She is the chair of the Elders, uh, former president of Ireland. She was the first woman to uh, hold this uh, post. She is a former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and a special envoy of the United Nations for uh, Climate Issues. Uh, so I request, uh, please, all the members of this panel, speakers of this panel, to uh, keep the uh, time of 10 minutes. So welcome, Mary. And thank you so much for participating. You have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to join you at this first global policy dialogue to take place in the Global South. I'm sorry I have to do it virtually, but I'm with you very much in heart and spirit. I spoke at last year's Global Policy Dialogue in DC, and I'm pleased that this year it's being hosted by our Brazilian friends. At this moment, we stand in solidarity with Brazilians as you reel from the extremist attacks aimed at overthrowing the democratic will of the people. I hope the violence will end very soon, not least because the more the Brazilian government is taken up with having to fight extremism, the less they will be able to co concentrate on deforestation in the Amazon and on bold climate justice reforms. I like the question you posed on how to ensure global governance institutions are better equipped for climate justice and for the triple planetary crisis you've all been referring to, climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. The Climate Governance Commission which I am pleased to co-chair, along with Johan Rockström and Maria Fernanda Espinoza, is looking at exactly this question. It aims to hold, to build momentum around global governance reform ahead of the summit of the future. And I invite you all to feed in to your, our recommendations and report, which is due out later uh, this year. I'd like to say a few words about synergies between the three Rio conventions. Science is clear that we cannot address the climate crisis without addressing the biodiversity one and vice versa. Yet now they occur in parallel processes within the UNFCCC and CBD respectively, leading many to question why we have separate convention processes for issues that goes so hand in hand. This feels like obsolescence in the multilateral system. And it's no wonder that the CBD system and the UNCCD on desertification suffer from a lack of high level political attention. The challenge is how to strengthen convergence. There is, as you probably know, a liaison group between the three secretariats but there is still insufficient alignment. Perhaps it's time to update the conventions 
and put in place a mechanism for getting them to talk to each other. One tool for convergence is aligning the science. In the case of climate, the regular policy relevant IPCC assessments endorsed by all governments are a kind of North Star that have helped to focus discussions and drive policymaking. Broadening these assessments out to cover all planetary boundaries, a kind of IPCC for the planet, should help us to see the interconnections. Ultimately, our global governance needs to support countries to have a systemic approach to understand that every decision about land will be critical for the climate agenda and for the biodiversity agenda and also for the transformation of the food system. The Just Energy Transition Partnerships with South Africa, Vietnam and Indonesia last year are promising. They are promising new forms of international cooperation. But beyond the energy sector, we need more partnerships and alliances to support just transitions also in the food and in the land sector, remembering that this is also a big source of emissions, especially in developing countries. You know, let's just think about it. The way we farm, transport and consume food affects planetary boundaries more than any other sector. You asked about climate justice. I've been inspired recently by reading Earth for All, a survival guide for humanity, which some of my fellow climate governance commissioners have authored. It uses complex modeling to explore what needs to be done to tackle the planetary crisis and the inequality crisis together. The book tells the story of four girls from four different countries and continents of the world, born in 2022, and describes their life under two different scenarios. One is a business as usual scenario called too little too late. And the other is a giant leap scenario, which succeeds in improving well being for all within planetary boundaries. This last scenario requires us to act now with the largest effort and investment this decade. The book concludes, it is possible to be optimistic about our future on Earth. It is possible to transform to well-being economies and to ensure a good life for all on a finite planet. And we can achieve much of it within a single generation. The choice is ours to make. A giant leap requires five extraordinary turnarounds to eliminate poverty, to reduce inequality, to empower women, and to transform the food and energy systems. At the heart of the change is moving beyond GDP growth as a guide for a healthy economy. And it proposes citizens' assemblies as a way to help overcome political resistance to economic systems change. Most relevant to our discussions today, the Earth for All initiative also supports bold proposals for reform of the global financial institutions, in line with Mia Motley's Bridgetown initiative, such as using new special drawing rights to mobilize over one trillion US dollars per year to developing countries for green jobs creating investments. Reform of the global financial system is going to be an important climate justice agenda this year, and one that I hope will continue to gather political momentum. The elders are very supportive. And in fact, we will be in Washington next week, we'll be meeting both with the head of the World Bank and with the executive um, board of the World Bank um, as a whole. And you can trust that we will do our best as elders to continue this conversation and to explain the climate justice dimensions of financial reform that opens up the coffers and releases so much more money for development, particularly in developing countries who need to go green in order for us to have a secure and safe world. Thank you for your attention. I now hand over to other panelists.
Muito obrigada, Mary, pelas suas contribuições. Eu vou passar agora a palavra para o doutor José Graziano, que é diretor-geral do Instituto Fome Zero e ex-diretor-geral da Organização das Nações Unidas para Agricultura e Alimentação, a FAO. Graziano atuou no gabinete do presidente Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva como ministro extraordinário de Segurança Alimentar, onde ele foi responsável pela implementação do programa Fome Zero. Então, ninguém melhor do que ele para falar um pouco dos impactos das mudanças climáticas no mundo em desenvolvimento, sobretudo no que diz respeito ao combate à fome e à pobreza. Obrigada, Graziano. Graziano. Muito obrigado aí Thank pelo convite. Thank you so much for your invitation. É, é um prazer It's estar such aqui. a pleasure to be here. Principalmente, especially Let me acknowledge uh, Mary Robson. Long time that we don't see each other. <laughs> uh, e, e também aqui minha amiga Isabela. And also my friend Eu tenho Isabella. uma impagável I have such a debt with Isabella. If I have a chance during the break, I'll tell you the story. It was during my election. She took a trip and she'll tell you later. I would like to seize the opportunity, since we have such short time due to the broadness of the theme, but I do imagine that the invitation you have made me involves telling me telling my experience at the FAO and in the UN system. I spent 15 years in the system, and I'm mostly impressed with the lack of solutions that are practical for the major problems that we have. You know, the lack of pace between diagnosis and the measures that are proposed. And this is reflected, and let me start, by talking about the very proposal of our common agenda. If you read the introduction, I do have a summary, but we're so short on time, and I'm going to summarize. But the Secretary General points to six reasons why we should accelerate the implementation of the existing agreements, especially the SDGs. This would be enough. We wouldn't need anything else, but he lists the six main ones, and he says, in this time of division, fracturing, and lack of trust, the action of the UN is more than necessary if you want to ensure a better future. Based on this report, I would like to ask to a committee that is going to be advising us on this theme and create a summit for the future to create a new global consensus of what should be done. It's very good as an intention, but in practice, as an urgent thing, it's nothing, you know. And this is the system of the United Nations nowadays. Besides being a great job for many, there's this rule which should involve paying 15% above the equivalent national salary, which makes nowadays the majority of the organizations in this system to spend between three quarters to 80% of their resources in their own staff. Uh, so there are no purposes for these funds besides those for final actions to be taken. So what I'm trying to show you here is that this lack of action in the system is not due to the conjuncture. It's actually part of the DNA of the system. You know why? I'll show you later the UN Charter. In the act of creation of the UN, the sovereignty of the national states would be ensured. And after that, all of the process unfolds and every decision should be made through a consensus. And there is no operational manner that is defined in the UN Charter for that. The second point I would like to mention, uh, taking the opportunity, this is my area of expertise, is that before we propose this triple planetary crisis, a theme that involves addressing many of the themes that 
Mary just mentioned about biodiversity and climate change. There is another intention that is called the diagnosis of global syndemic. It was actually proposed in January 2019 by the Lancet Commission to tackle jointly themes involving obesity and malnutrition as these were being affected by climate changes. This is actually an extraordinary report because it's actually concentrating in the proposals of what should be done to tackle these things and not their diagnosis, you know. And third, I would like to show you the difficulties in finding an alternative mechanism to the multilateralism of the United Nations system as the proposal of the multi-sectoralism that was used in the recent World Summit for Food, and this actually was quite a failure. Well, I spent half of my time just in the introduction. So let me start by saying the first point is, I don't know if you've heard about an eminent Italian jurist, Luigi Veragioli, his book is called For a Constitution for the Earth, Humanity, and This Crossroads. This will be available this year thanks to an effort that we made together to translate it into Portuguese. It's only available in Italian and Spanish until this moment. But this is a proposal for us to evolve after the UN Charter towards a constitution. And he's basically saying that this changes things, since the Constitution should be followed uh, through norms for it, to, for it to be made concrete. So how can we ensure the rights that are ensured in this letter? The UN Charter is about maintaining peace, happiness, and there is no mechanism to implement this, except the only mechanism to implement the UN Charter it's the International Court for Law. It's a court that has to do with the affiliation that is voluntary, so the major powers that are not part of it, because it's very frail. There is no other mechanism. So the failure of the UN system is due mainly to the lack of compliance with the fundamental rights due to the lack of guarantees. I don't even have to say how Ferragioli is so uh, much of an exponent of guarantism internationally, and especially in Brazil, Dr. Ulysses was often taking counsel from him. So the second reason why this fails, as I said, is a lack of mechanisms for implementation. The UN system does not have any other way or resources except for voluntary donations and also a contribution that comes from the states that is compulsory and many of them just don't pay. The main ones that are not paying the UN system, besides the traditional one, the US, they are usually paying one or two years behind to keep the system under pressure. And another one is Brazil, and I do hope that we'll start paying this year. They did, right? So they won't lose their vote. OK, this is how it goes. So it's a system that does not have its own resources. And Fair Jolly is proposing one of the fundamental changes besides having this constitutional framework, but also involving the institutions to implement it. There is no point in having a constitution that will ensure health care for everybody if we don't have a national health system like we do. So that's the theme. And the institutions that are implementing these, such as FAO, it's not like a mechanism for direct intervention. Ferragioli reminds us well of Noah before the deluge. And it makes us think about the current situation because no one was believing in Noah before, but many people aren't believing in him now, but still the limitations are still the same. So this is what we're talking about. 
The second point, the global syndemic. This global syndemic proposed by Lancet that was based on three topics, obesity, subnutrition, and climate change. Well, because climate change is starting to affect everybody through building connections with all the major problems we face. I don't know if you are aware, but we have 2 billion people that are overweight or obese in the world, and this costs around 4 million deaths a year and 3% of the world's GDP. That's all. I mean, this would be enough to pay for the bills of proper health care. Just for you to have an idea of the magnitude of the CFAO budget, which is the second larger, largest agency in the system, is equal to the Embrapa budget in Brazil. Just for you to have an idea of the magnitude of what we're talking about here. The Lancet report is making two proposals that I would like to highlight. One is a convention framework over food systems that is similar to tobacco, which was extremely functional. And there is another one, which is a proposal of a fund, a global food fund. So you don't need this amount of resources with different products in each place. So when you have an epidemic of starvation, you can use. So this proposal comes from the creation of a few in the year 1945. It was the first agency that was created in the UN system. And it was vetoed precisely by the United States and Great Britain at the time. You know why? Because this eventually became a great business. I feel is now a major business that's operated by an agency, which in reality is a program, the World Food Program, that is controlled from the very beginning, from the 1960s, with the fear of the great starvation in China, which made the world open this agency to deal with hunger more operationally bringing food when there is starvation present. So this is a World Food Program. The World Food Program has its airplanes and ships and all kinds of operation skills like storage houses. And they are now changing directors. So there's this report that was published last December for accountability. And there are seven billion coming from American donations and seven billion coming from international donations. So they have 14 billion. The estimation by Lancet is that we will need in this fund just to start 70 billion. Why wasn't this created then? Because it would be allowing too much power for an agency that would intervene in markets. That's not the only case of systematic boycott to create operational mechanisms. They are created because there is some control from the United States to send their excessive crops in order to help tackle starvation around the world. Another case involves speculation. It's been years this was identified, such as in the Ukraine war, that we don't really have anything to do with the Ukrainian war when it comes to food, but fertilizers, really. Oh, but, you know, the wheat in Brazil, the leap was like 40% in March and April, right after the war started in the prices you know this all involves speculation so now we have tap another agency that is proposing a mechanism for intervention to avoid speculation with food and this has been approved in all of the congresses but never implemented because the power for regulation today of commodities remains with the american agency I can't recall its name right now, Central Commodity Agency of the US, I don't know, whatever. This prevalence in national spaces of uh, international aspects is in the very DNA of the system, preventing it from acting many times. So I would like to now move to the summit from 2021. 
In 2019, one of the latest actions I participated was to deliver to the Secretary General a diagnosis that the world was going to face. Actually, this was before the pandemic. We didn't know. But we knew there would be an unprecedented crisis. Not due to the climate impacts, but the economic recession that was building up and also conflicts in poor countries in Africa and in the Middle East as well. So we asked for the summit. And this was mainly to avoid bureaucracy in the United Nations, such as establishing a consensus and having a final document drafted. But this was not due to the multilateralism involved, but actually this process where everyone would participate because it would be more democratic, people would be able to speak. And then 18 months of dialogues took place around the world nationally, regionally, internationally. Over 3,000 proposals were generated. There was a certain moment where the representatives of the civil society no longer participated due to criticisms because they were in equal conditions with international corporations that had different economic interests involved. So what came out of this summit? that was worldwide, very little. Not even the mechanism of creation for the International Fund to tackle starvation that was previously agreed before the summit was created. And this was practically not implemented, practically no donations from the private sector that actually wanted to sit down on the table on the front and saying that they were going to give money to the system. And then, once again, we have this declaration. A hub was created at the FAO in order to coordinate actions in a hub with no money nor staff. Okay? And preparing a new meeting now in October, two years later to take stocking. I really don't know of what, but that's the proposal, okay? There was this process of great mobilization, there is no doubt. I mean, there were so many organizations coming, and including the one that I now coordinate, Institute Fomizero, that is going to mobilize the debate, but we didn't move any further than that once again. I would like to end my presentations by saying that the way starvation is happening around the world is still not threatened by the debate involving climate change, even though every single year this aggravates. What threats, basically, the situation is the economic crisis, because hunger is not a problem in the whole world, such as in Brazil, maybe Brazil would be the best example. We have plenty of food. What we don't have is enough money to buy all the food, you know. The supermarket shelves are filled, but the consumer's cart is empty because consumers are poor. So that's the dilemma, excess right now. But this is quickly changing the scenario, especially because the products now, such as wheat, which is the most consumed product in the world, this is going through erosion in its, in its nutritional power due to the increased temperature and the amount of CO2 in the air. So even the pasta we would eat before that was nutritious and from the mama, now we have only half of the nutritional values, and this will be less and less generating further intolerances to gluten and other kinds of diseases. So the medium to long term impact of climate changes for food and eating, not only hunger and starvation, because we should not relate hunger with the lack of food. There are many reasons for hunger to take place. Only one of them is a lack of food, really, due to the Green Revolution that took place over 50 years ago. There is no real starvation in the world except for the Chinese crisis in the 1960s. But actually, now we have a matter of access, which is a major problem. So what is the path ahead? Ferragioli has this very interesting 
centers that is important to mention. The main heritage we're bringing from the 20th century is the UN system. That's the only moment that everybody in the world agreed to do the same thing. So the path is not to look for a different multi-sectoral system, but to reform the UN system by improving its distribution of power and radically changing things. Uh, Adriana mentioned food security. As an example, the World Council for Food Security has this type of representation where the representatives of civil society, of indigenous peoples, they have the same decision power as the governments do. And this is a mechanism that has been extremely efficient in recommending actions, even though it's slow to obtain consensus, but efficient. And it's been followed by governments, so multilateralism is a fundamental political thing. So I'll stop here. I'm running out of time. Thank you for your tolerance. Thank you, Graciano. I'll now pass the floor to Dr. Isabela Teixeira, who is a former Minister of the Environment of Brazil during the governments of Lula and Dilma. She's a co-president of the International Panel of Natural Resources for the UN and the Environment and a member of the high-level UN Desa Board for Economic and Social Topics. Isabella, as you all know, had a very important role during the negotiations of the Paris Agreement. And she's also one of the co-authors of the document that was led by CIPOL also in a partnership with the foundation, PCO and others, and has pointed towards new paths for Brazilian strategies for climate change and dealing with these aspects. And we have copies in English and Portuguese outside, so if you're interested, get one for you. Okay, now pass the floor to Isabella, who's going to be talking about the repercussions of the crisis for Brazil in this new context or not. So she'll talk about democracy, right? So let's see what she wants to say. She can say whatever she wants. Well, that's very dangerous, actually. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Speaking Portuguese, but first of all, I'd like to say hello to my good friend, special friend, Mel Robson. Nice to see you, okay, and excellent to share your thoughts. And we met in Sharma Sheikh and have been discussing different perspectives. So I'm trying, I'll try to bring some thoughts, okay, to be provocative ones provocative ones to try to understand better. I fully agree what uh, my friend Graziano mentioned here. Yes, you can fix multilateralism, but it's a huge task. So now I turn to try to speak, Braz put aside Brazilian English and try to speak English Brazilian. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation to support and all the co-organizers and organizations uh, who are participating in the opening session. I would like to mention three, four uh, aspects of the debates uh, which I have participated in with the different hats which Maya mentioned around the reform of the system and the challenges posed and the issue of the triple planetary crisis. Uh, maybe the first uh, issue to be addressed is of political nature. We are talking about uh, a political dimension which is planetary. It is not only global. Our new, this is a new dimension in the world, which and it is about how the countries and societies are connected by nature, which if uh, this lens was not used until now, the older ones among us, like me, I'm from the last century, we understand the evolution of this debate, and it uh, addresses the transport, the impact, the global impact, but now we're talking about planetary impact. This means 
means to understand, and Mary uh, spoke about planetary boundaries. We're talking about another uh, political dimension. This is extremely important to be observed because the dynamics cannot be the dynamics of, an inter of a global interdependency. And we have seen the disruptive process with the first global crisis, which everybody felt, which is the, the COVID uh, pandemic affecting global health. And uh, global health uh, affects still, uh, is still affected by the, by the pandemic and the post-pandemic. And so this addresses and, uh, the, the, the trans-border uh, crisis. The world stopped. The triple, the triple crisis, the environmental dimension, provokes uh, the, the world to stop. Either you change uh, the whole relationship, the, the, the economic and social relationships, and the second thing I wanted uh, to mention, because I live in a developing country, in an important country with regard to solutions, is that the triple planetary crisis occurs in a context of the crisis of democracy in the world. We have 89 countries with democratic systems in the world. That's less than half of the countries which are members of the United Nations. And when this discussion came up in the global perspective, which was in the 90s, when the United Nations promoted the debate of the whole decade with regard to global issues, starting with sustainability, then population, then the Conference of Beijing, then gender issues, etc. Etc. So this decade was a decade which uh, was uh, seen as a legacy for the for the 21st century. The conquest of democracy, particularly from in the, the developing countries, and Latin America was one of the key regions in this debate. Uh, is associated to the debate on sustainability of a world of a fairer world, of a more just world, and we are leading with this triple planetary crisis in the context of a crisis of the uh, democracy in the world, not only the consolidated democracies as the countries in development as well as young democracies as Brazil. I need not go into detail because uh, all of you, Brazilian and non-Brazilian, and Mary was an accomplice along these four years of the solidarity of the world when we talk about just transition with regard to democracy in a country which is so important for solutions of the environmental planetary crisis. So it's two issues, and I don't see people discussing this and uh, correlating this, but we need to do this because this is good for business, for transparency, for trust, and for social participation, political inclusion. But this, nothing of this is done without democracy, even democracy being a very open, a very wide concept nowadays. There is a whole range with regard to democracy in the world, which is quite interesting. So I recently asked this question about why democracies die and how to solve the triple planetary crisis. Which are the democratic arrangements in order to solve the triple planetary crisis? He said that this is the author uh, of why democracy dies. He said, well, this takes my sleep. So we are facing uh, the lack of democracy and populism when it comes to discussing loss and damages and adaptation to climate crisis is important. There's a third aspect in this debate which seems to me that the pillars of the triple planetary crisis have asymmetric relationships among them and the climate issue is a driver which, impo which imposes itself because it is clearly that uh, thing which uh, dialogues with the tensions of the short and long term and with regard to the choices regarding development of the developed countries and the developing countries. And this involves a very critical and sensitive uh, issue uh, in the international discussion. That is, if the climate crisis uh, has uh, common responsibilities, however differentiated, uh, if we look at 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, this is the number of the short term. So everybody talks about one and a half degrees uh, in the future. But the number of uh, the present is 1.2 degrees Celsius. And uh, this uh, has the predominance of the industrialized countries, and it has to do with emissions uh, when it comes to energy. When we look at the bio 
biodiversity crisis, so this crisis uh, affects uh, the countries in the south. And uh, so we have the greatest biodiversity. If we look at the world, and, uh, the world is round, even if something that is flat. But uh, when you look at the Earth, you see literally this dichotomy, which uh, illustrated 1992. So who was there in 1992? <laughs> uh, that, uh, you know about the political and diplomatic tensions uh, there and uh, how the international system uh, how the international system got, uh, got about the, uh, the system we see today. So when we talk about trans frontier um, borders, and so we need to look at how, this, uh, how the past has impacted the present. We have today emerging economies, emerging countries uh, with, uh, who are, have to be involved and are involved in the solution of uh, the climate crisis. In Brazil, we don't have only the Amazon region, but uh, we need to look at how the, about the, uh, the low carbon solutions for our food production, for our agriculture in cattle racing. So this choice needs to be made today. So there was a choice made 45 years ago in order to provide safety and food autonomy but we need to we need a new choice nowadays and but we don't have the stakeholders involved and particularly with regard to international trade and cooperation east-west cooperation in addition to north-south cooperation which uh, which provides a design and provides an idea for solutions in the multilateral system and this is not on the table neither strengthening the international health system and uh, it won't be with ministers of the environment that this question will be solved. There are other players in the room, there are other adults in the room and we need to understand again how these new adults in the room want to be part or wish to be part of the trajectory of construction of this new government, world governance, global governance system, not only looking at their rights but also at their duties at their obligation. And this is an interesting aspect brought by the ag agreement of Paris, the co-responsibility of the non-state actors. These people only talk about their rights, not about their duties. It's necessary to change this discussion, and we need to understand how we solve the problem of the great emittance of carbon, but also how we solve the problem of the poorest countries in the world who don't emit anything, who don't produce any emissions and but who have and who have no resources resources to address a solution for the impact so we need to look at 50 60 uh, countries in the world are the poorest countries and uh, this discussion is asymmetric is unfair and uh, I'm looking at my friend Mary and I know that it is her agenda when it comes to discuss the system of Bretton Woods and the reform of Bretton Woods when, you, when we talk about uh, climate justice if you need to understand this poles, these extremes in the world, if the seven countries in the G, of the G7 and, of the, and uh, if the GDP uh, of, the, is, uh, of the seven of the seven uh, GDP of the seven uh, G7 countries is larger than uh, the organization. So we need to think about how we can drive this uh, arrangement. We we have a global system and we need to think about how the UN system will relate to the like-minded groups, uh, G20, G7. Uh, I think this will not lead to uh, any solutions in the short term. There is a war to solve and this has exposed all the climate uh, problems, the whole alliance with regard to the, to the uh, the whole alliance involves the carbon economy. The solutions which are looked for, the energy involves uh, carbon. And the, the, so both uh, food safety in Europe is, uh, is um, under threat, just as the energy uh, issue. So Rus Russia and Ukraine, where Russia is an important producer of fertilizers, and so how will this impact our everyday life? And Europe is a strategic 
strategic actor in order to make advance this agenda. And in order to come to the end, I would like to make a provocation. The understanding of international cooperation, and I'm a person who is completely pro multilateralism. My whole career was made uh, in the field of multilateralism. I think that we can indeed uh, build construct solutions, but it's important to, when we look at this context, to look at the relationships between countries, between societies, the relationships between also with the private sector. These relationships are real. International cooperation is no more restricted to formal relationships between uh, countries and governments. The, the private sector cooperates, philanthropy cooperates, civil society cooperates, and these dynamics need to be need to be taken up by those who discuss solutions. They allocate money. They generate kickoffs. They they influence uh, decision making and associated to this new spaces, I would like to provoke you with regard to observing the role, I think Mary addressed that, the observing the role of science in this global dimension, science, and I am a co-chair of the research panel, science will not be after the pandemic and uh, after the climate crisis, will not be only responsible for informing, it will need to, uh, to exercise other roles, for example, as we see in the production of vaccines. And this knowledge is not only scientific, it, it has to do also with the, with the wisdom and the science of the, of the traditional uh, communities, traditional peoples. And so this is one of the greatest challenges humanity faces now, to know how to address and how to look at these uh, stakeholders and actors in the world. On the other side, we have, uh, um, we are in a, in a, in a, in a time uh, where we are facing uh, an environmental crisis. We are looking also at the convergence of this with the digital technological era. We have identified the problem in an analogical time, and we need to produce solutions in this new technological uh, time. Time. This is a é new mindset, tipo this is a new kind é tipo of going about politics, and it's another way of mobilizing people. people. And uh, the question which remains, and which seems to be, to be very important to be highlighted in this process, is uh, uh, in how far this, this uh, movement, our movement, which goes beyond uh, the environmental uh, issues, in how far this becomes a worldwide movement. It's not only about reacting, it's uh, about influencing the minds of the people to see the world based on that. It's not political parties with the same privileges of the past. It is a challenge. So how can we mobilize and create a mindset which enables, politically speaking, to do all that which has been addressed here, which are the processes of convergence, to allow that those who are different may converge and build solutions based on that. I think that this is a challenge which, uh, is, all, which, is, which is also imposed to those, for example, ecologists, environmentalists over the last 50 years. So they also need to understand that the frontiers are others. There is no uh, market uh, reserves. And another comment which I think which is quite challenging and which uh, understands the, uh, which looks at the relationship with the world in the East. Three fourths of the world's population is in the East. So we have the capacity of designing based on concepts uh, of the West, concepts which are important, such as alliances. But when, if you talk in China about alliances, they have a completely different perspective. Regarding India, it's also very different. The cultural aspects are uh, determining for those new multilateral relationships. The solutions for energy and food safety have to do with the dynamics of lifestyles. As Mary said, the issue of, uh, of the economy of well-being dialogues with uh, all these spheres. So we need to understand the planetary, the global planetary sphere, the 
group uh, uh, the perspective of the like-minded, but also of the big countries, not only due to their economies, but also their ter territories and with regard to their environmental actions. This is the case of Brazil, a, a country with singularities, alternatives, which needs to be bold with regard to its choices in the future. It needs uh, to do that. It needs to understand the world. It's not enough in itself, and it has national dimensions to resolve problems which are much uh, much wider than that of many countries. So we can't compare that. The solution for the Amazon is uh, of one kind, and the solution for the rest of Brazil is of another kind. And Brazil, as many other continental countries, uh, needs to have a strategic uh, role because uh, it or they own uh, resources and assets uh, and so, so, we, the, the, so the climate crisis should not be an accelerator of the democratic, democracy crisis, and on the other side, not allow that our choices lead to an acceleration of environmental inequalities in addition to the social inequality, the access to natural resources, the efficient use of natural resources, the allocation of natural resources is the crisis which is announced um, together with the triple planetary crisis. It is on the table. And that's what the real world needs to dialogue about when it comes to the choices uh, for the long, for the middle and long term. This vision needs to be part of the discussions which we are seeing today. And the feeling I have, my dear Graziano, is that we are still discussing about the past and the present with regard to deforestation in Brazil, something which should have been planned a long time ago. And we have great difficulties of bringing the future into the present to make decisions which enables us to tell new stories about the future. We need to learn of how to tell new stories about the future, and so I, I look at uh, a sign of hope in Brazil. There is a new generation in Brazil, young people, 25 years old, around 25 years old, and uh, so I will say young people up to 40 years, I was generous. And this is a fascinating generation, engaged generation. They uh, are engaged in studies, they provide solutions, they suggest solutions. So we, Mary Graziano, we are really part of the ancient heritage, but we need to learn that we have a role to play with regard to uh, the youth and uh, we need to, it's now time to get together because they will be those who will handle this and manage this uh, in the next uh, 10 years. And I hope to be in Pernambuco and Bahia, relaxing without uh, climate change, without uh, uh, levels, without sea rise levels. So I would like, Adriana, to tell you something. You have been very much engaged in these debates. This is about the risk, the uncertainty, and which is uh, being, and which is uh, on the table. I would like to say that it is necessary to respect the agreements which have been constructed, like the Agreement of Paris. Uh, be careful with the cover decisions. There is being a very strong movement, and Mary knows that about cover decisions and how this will change the dynamics of the agreement. I'm not saying that we don't sh that we should not evolve, but you need to know to evolve based on what has been agreed upon and not create our tensions in the very short term in the consent of those agreements which have been made. So it's uh, the discussions need to be true discussions. I will give an example. So uh, I, I can't stand any more people uh, talking about 100 uh, billion dollars uh, to for the climate uh, solutions. We need to find a way in multilateralism. We need to strengthen the spaces of solution. And one of the main challenges uh, which will arise from the debate of Bretton Woods is that the cooperation, international cooperation of the international banks, this community, dialogues with the players of the international cooperation of the UN system. They don't dialogue. They are not in dialogue. I can assure you that. So it's necessary to change the mindset about responsibility of those who have the power to make decisions uh, in the micro and macro levels and to uh, and to in order to be happy, uh, we need to 
have the freedom of choice. So let's uh, choose democracy. And this is maybe one of the greatest challenges Brazil has with regard to the triple planetary crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isabella. Now, I'll pass the floor to our last speaker before we open for comments from the audience. Dr. Maria João Rodrigues, who is the president of the Foundation for Progressive European Studies, FEPS, which is a partner organization of this event. We're really thankful for your support and everyone else in your team, Tainá, Aline, all of those who are here who are fundamental for the preparation that we had to do to get here. So she's not only the president of FEPS, but Maria João was also a member of the European Parliament and the Minister of Employment during the Antonio Guterres ministry. Thank you, Maria João. Thank you so much from me. And I will bring now one European Union voice. And I'm really um, very honored to follow the sequence of brilliant interventions in the opening session and then the, the panel. I, I was taking notes myself to, to change the, the message I'm bringing. And uh, let me start by saying that uh, we all know that we are in an historical moment for Brazil. Uh, democracy is at stake, and I wanted to know that European Union will support Brazil whatever it takes to strengthen democracy. This is the first thing I really want to underline. The second is, um, Brazil is also a great country to bring forward another message about democracy which is democracy at global level. We do need more democracy at global level to cope with the different global challenges. And that's why the conference today is so important. Because let's be clear about this, it's impossible to cope with the triple planetary crisis without stronger democracy at global level. This is the first uh, idea I'd like to bring to this uh, discussion. Why I'm so, uh, saying this? Well, first of all, because we know that in order to cope with this crisis, we need to conduct the greatest transformation of our lives. We need to change the way agriculture, industry, transports, housing, energy, are taking place in our countries. This is indeed a big transformation. And we also know that we are not on track. There is a very serious problem. I can tell you from the European Union side that we do have an ambitious agenda, which we call the European Green Deal. But right now we are struggling to stick with this agenda because we are dealing with a war in our continent. And the risk of backtracking is there. We also saw in the last COP, after several COPs, that again, we are not on track. So this is a central um, human existential problem. And uh, now we have, in fact, um, once in a generation opportunity, as Richard Pons was saying, because we have this sequence of three summits, one taking stock of the implementation of SDGs, another one going for reforms on global governance to address global challenges, and then the third one uh, to fine-tune what should be rebalanced to ensure social uh, justice at a planetary scale. 
this creates indeed a very important window of opportunity. So what should we do to use this opportunity? Look, I think that we indeed we need to have a very frank talk. That's why Adriane is so great that we Chipo and our partners in Brazil, we are organizing this conference now. Uh, this is a great moment for friend talk. So let me tell you what I think. Uh, what I think is that we have a problem about, um, in fact, global justice when dealing with the triple planetary crisis. And to be more concrete, uh, we know that developing countries, they need to develop themselves. They need to build up their in the industry, their services. But they need to take another road. They need to go another way, low carbon. Hmm? But they don't have the means because this uh, involves a lot of uh, innovation and a, a large-scale financial effort. And they completely change on the way trade takes place, by the way. Therefore, from my viewpoint, developed countries, they need to change their position in the dialogue with Global South. If they want developing countries to take another road, another way to develop themselves, they need to be much more cooperative. They need to support developing countries' effort with technological transfer and the necessary financial means. Otherwise, it seems to me there is no solution for this problem. And this collective responsibility. From my viewpoint, that's why we need uh, what is called a new global deal is in fact to rebalance the world in order to meet the kind of global challenge we uh, have in front of us. I'd like to come with uh, precise proposals and I'm sure that all over the conference will go on discussing this much more in detail. When I refer in joint work on uh, science and te technology, but in the broad sense, this is about, let's say, engineering solutions, for instance, for energy, but also a lot about, about social sciences, uh, because we need to have exchange of views on how to conduct social change and how to conduct fair transitions in all these sectors in all domains of our collective life. And you also need to, uh, to uh, take into account, in fact, different civilizations. Mm -hmm. uh, Isabel Teixeira was speaking about the uh, um, Eastern uh, 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 life and, and tradition. In fact, this is different. And we need uh, to relaunch this dialogue uh, between civilizations to increase mutual understanding. Uh, when it comes financial means, yes, what is at stake is large-scale, long-term investment process. This is not about, let's say, billions. This is about trillions in terms of scale. So how can we get this? First of all, by channeling private investment in the right direction with clear standards, clear rules, and uh, phasing out all kinds of subsidies for uh, carbon-intensive energy sources. Secondly, we need to develop new instruments of a kind of um, global budgetary capacity. What do I mean by this? 
First of all, the way we address high indebted countries. We should use debt swaps to encourage countries which are highly indebted to implement SDGs to cope with climate and uh, by that being able to reduce their debt burden. Another important instrument already referred by Mary Robinson, from my viewpoint this is decisive, is to go further with the special drawing rights. Uh, because in fact, these are an embryo of a global budgetary policy. And we need this. And this should be backed by, in fact, own resources of the multilateral system. We have this. I can uh, tell you that in European Union, uh, we have an interesting experience about this. And we know this is possible. We could overcome the pandemics because we invent a new budgetary instrument. This is possible. And finally, taxation, because let's not make uh, mistakes. This is no longer just about development aid. This is about changing the taxation system to have a fairer one. Starting with the big polluters who should pay their fair share and to use these resources to support those who in fact uh, they don't have high responsibility, but they are highly damaged by climate change. This is a basic solution uh, to address uh, climate uh, injustice. And my final point regarding means is the role of trade. I'm sure that we'll go on discussing this over, over the conference. I'm saying that because right now we have a big trade agreement uh, to be adopted between the European Union and Mercosur. Mm? Uh, but I think that something fundamental is missing in this trade agreement. Because basically, and again I need to be telegraphic, we should have a trade agreement which enable both sides to develop sustainable agriculture and industry and enable both sides to implement SDGs in order that we can reduce social inequalities in all our countries. This is a very demanding approach. Trade can be a very powerful tool, but trade agreements, they need to be designed with this purpose. My final point is about governance. Because I completely agree with many remarks made by my panel colleagues that we have a global governance system of the 21st century to address the challenges of the 21st century. So something is wrong here. We need to have a much more systemic approach because all these challenges are interrelated, as Mary Robinson just underlined so well. So this means that um, we need to have this comprehensive approach and also inclusive at all levels of governance, the local, the national, the macro region, example here, Mercosur, but also the global level. And here the system is really seriously outdated. Starting with COPs. We see this. How come? Mary is completely right. How come do you have a COP for climate and another COP for biodiversity? This makes no sense. So we need to streamline this radically. And we need to put the focus now also on creating the conditions for real implementation with a precise monitoring system because we are extremely light. But I also think that when we deal with the emerging situations, the idea of an emergency platform bringing together all the instruments, all the actors which should be put together also makes a lot of sense. And I know that some proposals are being prepared in this direction. But uh, let me conclude by saying that I also think even this, this is not enough. I really believe that we need to change 
the architecture of the United Nations system by bringing about a top council, which is really representative of the world and really able to deal with the, all the challenges in an interconnected way. I can tell you from our own European experience, we have one single European Council where all the countries are represented and we deal with all the challenges at the same time. The climate, the poverty, the digital change, the peace and war, in the same council. And by the way, in interaction with uh, the other institutions of uh, European democracy. So I really think that we need to um, discuss um, a serious update of the uh, multilateral system. And I'm sure that a conference like this one, so well designed, with such a good uh, representation from different parts of uh, what is at stake, will give a big contribution. So many thanks again for Chipo and Adriana. Thank you. I would like to thank all of the speakers and all of the partners. I won't summarize because it wouldn't be enough for everything that was mentioned, but it's quite clear from what everybody said that we are in a geopolitical moment that is quite complex. Let's not forget we have an ongoing war in Europe. And at the same time, multilateral institutions for all of the United Nations that should be the most prepared body to handle these things is now going through a context that's now weakened, being attacked all over the world for the past few years and also dealing with structural problems that are quite complex, such as the point Adriana mentioned about the lack of reform in the Security Council that is also reflecting a geopolitical structure that is post-war. Precisely by exposing this deficit in democracy, as Isabella and others mentioned, this democratic deficit is reflected in the inner challenges of each country, such as in Brazil in the recent episode, this was proved, but we have a democratic deficit in the very structure of governance globally, which reflects in all of the agendas, especially in the climate agenda. This is quite clear, as Isabella highlighted, how emissions and large companies that are issuing plenty of emissions and they are still adapting and mitigating historically, but we do know how the effects are felt much more in the developing countries. And they're still not getting the support that was promised, which is enough already, as it's been mentioned as well. And we recently had in COP27 back in Egypt a decision on damages and losses. This is quite not well established in terms of how the fund will be established in Montreal. We also had the new agreement and the global framework for biodiversity settled. And as we mentioned here, these agendas should be talking between themselves a lot better. But what we do hope we can discuss here is how we can change this deficit in democracy in global governance or how countries such as Brazil and others in the global south can have more voice and contribute to the reform processes. So I hope we can discuss this very well today, but we still only have 10 minutes left now. So I'll open for two or three questions or comments, but ask you to speak shortly. And if you can please answer in one minute or so, it would be great for us to end the session at 10.30 local time as planned. So we'd like to ask people to uh, who have a comment to raise your hand. If you have a question, please raise your hand as well. I'm looking at Fernanda here. Please, can anyone bring the microphone to... <coughs> so, Fernanda, please. Thank you, everyone, for your... I don't know which language should I speak. Let me just speak Portuguese, okay? Thank you all for your brilliant contributions. They were excellent. I have a question for Isabella. I was quite intrigued by what you mentioned, Isabella, about 
be careful with covering decisions and how the agreements should be fulfilled. And I completely agree with you. But I'm curious, and I want to understand what this actually means, the covered decisions that we have. And I'm working quite closely in WWF. I'm Fernanda Carvalho. I'm the head of policies in WWF International. And we work so much trying to have important decisions in these covered decisions to make them respect the principle of increasing that region and being more ambitious than the ones in the previous COPs when it comes to climate. Thank you. Before I pass the floor to you, Isabella, let me just have another question asked, because then we do have a comment or question here before I pass the floor for Isabella Iago, and then Maya, and then we'll close. Let's have three then, Iago and then Maya. Thank you, everyone. Before anything else, I would like to introduce myself. I am Iago. I'm the official senior program for UN Society Foundations for Latin American Caribbean, coordinating climate justice. And I was quite intrigued, especially with what some people said when they mentioned the democratic crisis we're living through. And we're talking about reforming the UN in a broader sense. So how can we talk about reforming the UN if we have a democratic crisis that is so strong all over the world? As you all know, the focus of open societies should tackle authoritative governments and there is no multilateralism in authoritative government. So I would like to ask a larger question here for all of the speakers. Can you please go deeper in this theme that I mentioned? And also I'd like to remind you how the discussion involving democracy is linked in some countries with the discussion on the triple planetary crisis. It's important to mention how in Brazil, in the attempted coup on the 8th, one of the main financiers of this attempt, and President Lula mentioned in the first live stream he made after the attempt, and we're talking about agribusiness, we're talking about illegal wood factories that are paying for coups in the democratic structure in Brazil, and also not only in Brazil, we have mining activities as well, we have things going on in Chile and Colombia that are so similar. So I would like to ask this question for you all, for your consideration, of course, and comments if you will. Thank you. Maya? visionary comments uh, uh, the panelists to introduce this policy dialogue. This was really inspiring and quite profound. Uh, and my question for you, for anybody um, on this introductory panel is, uh, I very much agree with comments that this is the greatest transformation of our collective lives that we're called to, to tackle the triple planetary crisis, the climate emergency. Uh, Secretary General, others have called every nation in the world to declare a climate emergency. Uh, so, but it's it's not understood. Uh, it, it's a new sort of phenomenon now in the Anthropocene. It's, it's it's an unprecedented sort of crisis for humanity. So it's it's different. For example, for in response to a war, an armed conflict, we see with the the Ukraine crisis and the invasion there, we have a lot of political bold imagination. For example, to establish a new ad hoc tribunal to try the crime of aggression. Uh, in, the, in the face of the Ukraine sit situation, uh, response to an imminent COVID uh, global pandemic. So my question to you is any ideas about how to open the sort of uh, political imagination, the aperture of, of, of having more bold, really much more bold and systemic uh, international government reforms? I, I agree very much with uh, Maria Zhao's uh, comments uh, that we need a systemic, comprehensive approach, uh, the financing, uh, taxation, et cetera. We, we, need, we need to connect the dots and have very bold proposals across a whole range of international governance uh, areas. So any thoughts about how to catalyze much more that bold uh, political imagination of the international community at this crossroads, and then how to sustain the courage and the leadership to sustain through uh, the reforms that we, in fact, need, just given the reality of the, the triple planetary crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. I'm going to repeat the question because I believe Mary Robinson had a problem with 
with her connection. The first question is from Fernanda about covert decisions when it comes to a point that Isabella mentioned regarding the tensions these decisions often cause in agreements that were previously made initially, as in the case of the Paris Agreement. And we also had a question about Iago issue involving democracy and how can we deal with the international deficit in democracy when we have a challenge that is an internal deficit as in Brazil. Maria João, can you comment on democracy and then Isabella will talk about covert decisions and then Graziano will be reacting to the comments from Maya. I'll try to have these in two minutes so we can close. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. I will again come back to the, uh, my reply in English. Look, uh, is it a fact that uh, democracy isn't a threat in, in many countries? Nevertheless, I don't think we need to wait to solve these problems at national level to push for more democracy at global level. Because uh, um, Isabella, by the way, was referring to this. The big... Uh, a game changer will be a larger global public opinion movement involving citizens wherever they are, including in countries under dictatorship. This is what can make the difference. And this is the kind of actors we need to bring together in the coalition to, to change global governance. Um, and uh, I'd like also to say something about uh, my uh, uh, question. Because we need to uh, find a way to move faster. For me, is to support this movement of, um, in fact, public opinion, citizens, opinion makers, wherever they are. Second is to make the best of two other kind of entities as, a, let's say, accelerator of global governance. In order to update multilateralism, let me make this very clear. I think we do need a multilateral system, but an updated one. Which are the two entities I'm referring to? One is the G20. From my viewpoint, the G20 is a clear progress regarding G7. We invented this after the financial crisis, and uh, we had uh, ups and downs, but overall, is much more representative of the world. So let's make the best of this, including to implement sustainable development goals. They have their responsibility. And the second one is the role of the so-called macro regions, the regional organizations. Because if you put together European Union, African Union, Mercosul, or whatever the organization you uh, decide for Latin America, ASEAN, and some others, and if we put them around the table, we don't need many people, okay? If you just have the heads of these regions. Hmm? By the way, this is foreseen as a regular meeting with the United Nations Secretary General. And if they commit themselves to implement SDGs and to make something serious to uh, cope with the triple planetary crisis, this can make a difference, I believe. Hmm? So um, I, I think we need to organize the political game in another way. This is my, my proposal. Thank you, Maria João. I'll give the floor to Mary Robinson because I know she has to leave really soon. So please, Mary, if you want to react to any of the questions or Maya's in particular about systemic change, feel free. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a most interesting and thoughtful discussion. I welcome uh, the contributions of all the panelists and largely agree with the points that have been made by them. But now we're into uh, the questions. And I think what we do need um, is uh, to uh, find the way forward. And I want to build on what uh, Maria Jo was saying. Um, I think we need both a leadership in crisis mode. And sadly, our leadership is not yet in crisis mode. It should be, but it isn't. Uh, overall, about the scale of crises we've been talking about, the triple crisis. And this should be enough to have all leadership in crisis mode. But as well as that, 
we need this broad public opinion. And within that, if I may say so, I think there's room for women's leadership. It's another story. I'm trying to work on that um, as a side thing and, uh, and, and through the elders as well. But um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, and then we need a focus. I think in 2023, we have important things. Um, in the context of the COP, uh, we have the fact that there is the, uh, you know, the taking stock, the stock taking. Um, and I think this must be used, um, especially by uh, the broadest range of civil society to say, we will no, no longer tolerate greenwashing. We will no longer tolerate. Um, and th there's a lot of um, important breakthroughs happening at the moment. The outing of Exxon of knowing um, for a long time the damage caused by uh, fossil fuels. The, um, the meetings in Davos at the moment, the young climate activists, Greta Thunberg and her colleagues, who are calling for a cease and desist. The, the elders will support that cease and desist by fossil fuel companies. They have to learn, not that they must continue with what they're doing and try and uh, find a PR way of formulating it for the public, no. They have to really engage in getting out of fossil fuel and they have to do it very rapidly and we have to be with them on that. And then there's what I was talking about, the uh, Mia Motley um, Bridgetown initiative and other initiatives um, to get large resources for developing countries. All of this has to happen in 2023. It has to happen now because we've only seven years to 2030. It's a very short time and a lot to do and therefore we need both the top down crisis mode and the bottom up no, not no longer tolerating the greenwashing the deceptions the rest of it and holding the feet to the fire of all governments and i hope that we'll see this in 2023 a coming together and a a real uh, really bold initiatives of the kind that maya is talking about and i hope that our global governance commission can contribute to that thank you so much mary for being with us today. Hope you're enjoying uh, your winter. We are here enjoying the heat. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for making the time despite the, the time difference. I will then pass to uh, Isabella Teixeira uh, para reagir. Depois, Graziano também, se quiser acrescentar para a gente encerrar. Obrigada. Uh, obrigada. Uh, muito brevemente, uh, Fernanda, a gente pode discutir de várias maneiras. Mas, we can discuss this very briefly in different ways, but uh, political concerns that are related to my experience is not really too small. The political process for negotiation and mobilization in countries varies. We need to act on the short term. We are going to change the direction of the climate crisis after the Paris Agreement, but I do agree we need new dynamics when it comes to the COPs. It's just not viable. It just won't work. It's not working, actually. I think Mary pointed towards that Maria, everybody is mentioning. So where are we going? We are involving other actors that are going to be engaged. People who are going to be talking about the global stock take as a procedural process, as many people are talking about. These are behind the scenes, really. No one knows. So it's important for people to find balance in the covert decisions, because the demand is important, the strategy. So how can we implement this in a setup for governance that will maintain the climate regimen that is based on this pact that was made. We, uh, we have raising sensitivities around the world, not only when it comes to greenwashing. Greenwashing is actually easier to understand, but there is the other side of the coin, which is green wishing. Together com green doing. Going together with the green ah, doing. Então, o Brasil é muito and Brazil is so Brazil representative of this. It's a country that actually needs to move green from wishing green wishing to green doing towards green doing greenwashing. without green washing. <laughs> And that's the synthesis of our discussions here. Of course, this is quite a light-hearted discussion, but this involves different dynamics, which require knowing what the demand is, so I will use the expression in Brazil, functional, strategically, for the short term. But we cannot postpone anything. We are 
out of time for the future. And I think it's important, as we're saying here, there are different topics which are correlated or involved directly with the space in the debate of the Paris Agreement. So it seems to me we need to understand the strength of these covered decisions so we can really make viable implementing what was agreed in the multilateral system without identifying both movements. We need to have a balance in participation in the dialogue of how will you mobilize because countries are often agreeing without necessarily wanting to implement. So this should not be part. So I could talk about several things with you, but this is just an alert in the sense that the dynamics for engaging the actors should be strengthened with the climate regime that is going to be decided in the pact. Let's not repeat what happened in 1992. It's as simple as that. We don't want countries to be developing after the Kyoto Agreement, as you do know. Like, there's nothing to do with it. As a negotiator of the Paris Agreement, I want it to work, all right? So we need the new dynamics. And I'm the person who actually, I was the one that was defending the state actors in the Paris Agreement, because it is a new agreement that brings this legal regime that is international in nature. So we should understand how we're looking at these covered decisions and have these in the things that can be implemented in the short term, not the green wishing, as I like to say it, that is going to be compromising green doing and exotic greenwashing marriage. See you soon, Mary. Thank you, Isabella Graziano. I have two comments, so we don't run out of time. First of all, I insist there is a lack of pace between our diagnosis, their severity of problems, and the means for their implementation. I think that's the fundamental point. Including some people who think that the aggravations of the problem will improve the means, but I do disagree. If this is the Noah's, Noah's Ark solution, this will not be saving many people, only those who have access to his Ark. So that's not how this goes. I think there are two points here. First, it's about resources. The minister, Maria João, mentioned a central point. We need another system for taxation that's global and implement this in order to have resources. We have the Tobin tax. People are talking about the Tobin tax. It was never implemented. Even the tax over airplane tickets that were removed. Lula has his own airplane, so he forgot now. Anyway, changing the system to have our own resources. Without your own resources, you can't do it. Second, I agree with the idea of the regional organizations. This is necessary valorization, starting with the global G20, G7, etc., but regionally. When it comes to implementation, the location is really important. And cultural differences, as Isabella mentioned, they're really important. So we have an assault. Well, that's fundamental for us to recover the action that's effective, right? This is the dimension we need. The Amazon has its own, organi its own organizations, and they need to be restructured. Well, this is how you implement things. You put the money there, you know? Second point, it's about democracy, public opinion, and so on. I'm really skeptical when it comes to actions such as Greta Thunberg. By the time it reaches the south, it would take millions and millions of corpses. I think this is our measurement of it. Well, we need to look at the different systems and see where the weak points are at. Let's look at my field, for instance. The discussion on the food systems is still based on the productive chain. Uh, it's agro, industries, and so on. And there is no comments from the consumers in this discussion. So the only way to change 
these would be through the organizations of consumers. Philanthropical and also the crooks all over the world could actually have a look at these consumers and their sides because consumers are the ones who are paying the bill for this change. So identifying those niches of social organizations that are now frail throughout the history of the system is a fundamental task for us researchers. We're so behind in pointing out who should be sitting on the table. The failure of the Summit for Food Systems was that, as we sat on the table, they were introducing themselves, I'm the study, I'm Global Foods, and so on. Everybody was there, ready to do their lobbying. And there were like one or two associations of consumers way in the back. So this point or solving who's voting and who has the right or who's going to vote the same one will vote another won't so the legitimacy is mandatory for it to go through democracy but on a different level of how we're going to exclude segments that are representative when you are inviting everyone to the table. So what is the criteria for this voting to be pondered? And then there is no other way out except for national states that are democratic and elected by the people, even if it's one or two percent more than another. That's what democracy means. There is no other way. Thank you. Thank you, Graziano, and thank you to all of the panelists and co-organizers of this event. And I do have some announcements, but I would like to ask you all to applaud first the panel. I would like to thank the people who are watching us on YouTube. Thank you so much. So we're going to end the transmission. And this was the only panel that was going to be broadcast. And tomorrow we'll have another panel that will be available online at 8.45 local time. And we can now end our broadcast. From the logistics perspective, I would like